Good afternoon, everybody. Um, for those who may be just joining us, I'm Suzanne Basala. I'm the Executive Vice President and COO of the U.S.-Japan Council. On behalf of the Council's President, Ms. Irene Hirano Inoue, who's in Tokyo and unable to be with us today, I would like to thank you all for joining us. I'd also like to express our deep appreciation to Admiral Blair, James Kendall, Brian Graff, and the Sasaka Peace Foundation USA team for inviting USJC to be part of this important day of reflection. The Council has been active in supporting the Tohoku region for the past five years, most visibly through our Tomodachi Initiative. The Tomodachi Initiative is run in partnership with the US Embassy in Tokyo, and as was just formalized last week in a signing ceremony in Tokyo, in partnership with the Government of Japan. We're honored to still be central to the long-term recovery of the Tohoku region through this public-private partnership. Today, I am very honored to introduce to you all a leader who was absolutely central to the success of the U.S. response to 311, Ambassador John Roos. Ambassador Roos came to his assignment in Japan with a storied career as a successful Silicon Valley lawyer culminating in his tenure as CEO of the top Silicon Valley law firm, Wilson Sansini. By the, time, by the time of the Great East Japan earthquake, he had served in country for over a year and a half, during which he had become the essential link between the Obama administration and the newly elected DPJ leadership, during what you may remember was a very difficult and tumultuous time of political transition that strained the alliance. In fact, on March 11th, he was already on his third prime minister. Ambassador Roos had captured the hearts of many Japanese through his travels throughout the country. He eventually visited every prefecture. His outreach to Japan's youth and women leaders and his laid back, approachable California style. On a larger scale, his historic participation in the atomic bomb commemoration in Hiroshima helped solidify his bonds to many Japanese. I think you all here, here know how singularly important Ambassador Roos was to leading the U.S. response from March 11th forward. Having worked in his front office, I can vouch for how hard he worked, how committed he was to the American people who depended on him, to the president and administration leaders who relied on his judgment, and to the Japanese government and people he pledged to support in any way possible. He worked ceaselessly, pushed all of us to do our best, asked the right questions at the right time, and ensured that we never lost sight of our purpose during this challenging time. Both Ambassador Roos and his wife Susie, who's also here today, have rightfully received many accolades for their leadership and their commitment to the U.S.-Japan relationship. It's a testament to their commitment and their affection for Japan that they have continued to stay connected to the country in their work now that they have returned to Silicon Valley. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the podium the Honorable John B. Roos, former U.S. Ambassador to Japan. Well, Suzanne, thank you for those incredibly warm words. If I can have a point of privilege here, um, I think with all the leaders, the amazing leaders in this room today, I think all of you know that you're only as good as the people that you surround yourself with. And when I was, had the honor of being chosen to be the U.S. ambassador to Japan, a little known fact is that a U.S. ambassador only gets to hire one person from the outside. The rest of the organization they inherit. And because I had had very little exposure, in fact, no exposure to our U.S. military and defense issues, uh, I wanted to find someone uh, with that level and depth of experience. And I will tell you, um, the luckiest, best decision uh, I ever made was having Suzanne Basala as, uh, as my Schedule C, who was by my side and Susie's side through our entire time in Japan. And there is no greater intellect, public servant, public servant person uh, than Suzanne Basala. So I want to thank you for all you did. Yeah. 
I also want to uh, thank the Sasakawa uh, Peace USA Foundation and the U.S. Japan Council, uh, which is obviously a close partner of ours in the Tomodachi Initiative, and say how wonderful it is uh, on behalf of both Susie and, and myself uh, to be back here in Washington, D.C. Uh, we don't get back here too often, but this was an event that both of us felt we wanted to be here not only to show respect um, for, all the, for all those who lost their lives and continue to suffer as a result of the March 11th events of five years ago, but also just to be with old friends, people that we went through an incredible bonding with uh, five years ago. As Amya Miller said, in some ways, the events of March 11th, 2011, and the weeks and months that followed seem like they just happened yesterday. But in other, way, in other ways, it seems like an eternity ago. And I think uh, these types of events are very important. And while memories fade with time, I have so many distinct recollections uh, from that period that will stay with me and I know they'll stay with Susie for the rest of our lives. Let me just share a few of them with you before we get into hopefully some time for question and answers. Uh, everyone has talked about where they were on March 11th. Uh, I had actually had, and Suzanne and our team had had a pretty eventful week in the week leading up to March 11th. Uh, the foreign minister, Minister Mayahara, at the beginning of that week had resigned his post. I would later learn how uh, consequential that was because the foreign minister, Matsumoto, who took his place, who we developed a close relationship with, was only in place for three days before the earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear crisis hit. So we, in real time, had to develop trust and a relationship that isn't always easy, but we were able to do it in that instance. I had taken a trip down to Okinawa early in the week because of a leak uh, that had come out of, uh, of an interview that had been done off the record that led to uh, some negative ramifications in Okinawa. And I decided that the best and smart thing to do was to go down to Okinawa and personally and publicly apologize to the governor, which was an unbelievably stressful, but I think important uh, situation. I had, and my team had learned a couple of days before the earthquake that the Asahi Shimbun was going to publish 7,000 documents of WikiLeaks and I had begun to make calls to, to Japanese government officials to, again, apologize and to give them a heads up that some of the things they may be reading uh, were not necessarily going to be that comfortable. I do want you to know that the job of an ambassador is not always to <laughs> apologize. <laughs> But that week uh, was a rough week, and uh, then we were sitting, as Suzanne pointed out, uh, in my office in the embassy uh, on March 11th, that afternoon, when the 9.0 earthquake struck. Um, we immediately, as General Field pointed out, evacuated the embassy because, quite frankly, even in Tokyo, uh, the intensity was so immense that we thought the embassy was going to come down. In the parking lot is where I first began to see the videos of the tsunami. And like everyone here in the audience, I had never seen anything like it in my life. And I was clearly shaken by what I was witnessing. A few minutes later, one of our critical locally employed staff, uh, who I had come to rely on so much, came up to me and informed me that uh, a friend of hers at the Ministry of Defense had informed her that a situation was developing at Fukushima. 
Um, that obviously would unfold in the hours after that. In that parking lot, we were finally able to make communication uh, with General Field. And in addition to that, uh, obviously the first thing we did was contact the President of the United States, President Obama, who was woken up and told of uh, the tragedy that was developing in Japan, as well as informing Secretary Clinton. So with that, we began uh, the weeks and months that followed. And as Suzanne pointed out, it was the instruction of the President of the United States, President Obama, uh, his words that said, do whatever we can possibly do to help our Japanese friends. And people ask me, was it because of the alliance that we had with Japan? The answer is no. It was because of the friendship and the deep respect that we developed uh, over decades between our two peoples. Some of my thoughts during that period of time was I couldn't help but be uh, impressed, and impressed is an understatement, with the incredible mobilization of the U.S. government and our military to help in what we knew would be a very small way uh, to help our Japanese friends. Operation Tomodachi has been talked about all morning and what the self-defense forces, the Japanese self-defense forces and the U.S. military did together was awe-inspiring. I will never forget, uh, as the crisis wore on, my trip to the USS Reagan. And that was, it doesn't seem like it was that gap of time, but it was a month later on April 14th. And I stood there as a US ambassador to Japan and Minister Kitazawa and the leaders of the US military. And I was there to, as Minister Kitazawa was, to thank the US troops. And I looked over the sea of light and it is a vision and a moment of being so incredibly proud that I will cherish for the rest of my life. There was also not just the military, but as Suzanne called it, the bureaucracy, the U.S. government, uh, through our disaster assistance response team that stepped up in such a significant way. And I remember actually sitting in my office um, and uh, it could have been Suzanne, I don't remember exactly who it was, walked in and said, uh, the representative of DART wants to come and meet with you. And uh, my reaction was, what the hell is a DART? <laughs> but it was probably the most important and impressive uh, part of the US government that stepped up uh, in the crisis in addition to our military. It's a part of USAID and it released incredible amount of resources. And the next day, the head of DART, Bill Berger, was sitting in my office on that Saturday and said, Mr. Ambassador, what resources do you need? And started naming things out and they were there in an instant. But fortunately, the head of USAID, uh, Raj Shaw, actually had the foresight uh, to put nu two nuclear experts on the DART team. And when this team goes to all parts of the world, you typically do not require nuclear expertise. But he had the foresight to put those two nuclear experts on the team. And by Sunday night, they were in place in Tokyo, and we were working to figure out how to help the Japanese not only confront the tsunami, uh, but obviously the nuclear crisis in any way we could. But I would be remiss if I didn't say perhaps the most uh, moving part of the response on the American side of the equation was the individual Americans. We heard from a member of a JET member earlier today um, the jets that were out there, and, and we lost two Americans, one of which was a jet, 
uh, during the crisis um, was amazing because the Americans that were there, and, and it wasn't just Americans, it was other countries as well, they didn't want to leave. They wanted to help. They wanted to be there on the ground doing whatever they could. And it was not only JET members, NGOs, corporations, the incredible mobilization of the private sector was, was just um, very, very impressive as well as Americans back here at home. Um, perhaps the most moving part of it was when these children in different elementary schools throughout the country would send origami cranes um, to the young children uh, in the Tohoku region. And I know how it must have touched their hearts. One of the most um, difficult, moving, inspirational, moments for me during the crisis was my first of uh, the many trips I ended up making to the Tohoku region, which was 12 days into the crisis. Just as a little backdrop of why it was 12 days and not before or after, um, a few days into the crisis, General Field and Minister Kitazawa were heading up to uh, the Tohoku region to show their support and to survey the situation. And we had a conversation on uh, whether or not I should be part of that delegation. And it was at that point in time that I made the judgment that because of the nuclear situation in particular that was unfolding, and we didn't know how it would unfold, and we didn't know what resources would be needed uh, to confront the Fukushima situation, I felt that at that point in time, it was important for me to stay at the embassy and help manage uh, the, uh, the deployment of resources. Interestingly, I've never shared this before with too many people, but I talked to Secretary Clinton at the time, who, as you know, is currently running for the presidency. And I asked her, I said, you know, um, Madam Secretary, what do you think? What do you think I should do in this instance? And she said, go with your, she said, what are your instincts? I told her my instincts were to stay put and to find a time later to go up. And she said, I think your instincts are the right instincts and go with your instincts. And so it was 12 days later when the crisis was still going full blown, but we felt we were a little bit over uh, the hurdle with some of the major decisions we were making with the nuclear situation that I flew up there. And uh, I will never forget, and Admiral Willard was with me, I will never forget um, the scene of that helicopter ride of the 300 mile coastline. But at the same time, absolutely nothing could compare to uh, when that helicopter landed and we took an on the ground for the level of destruction, the loss of life, the people suffering. And I will never forget when I went into an evacuation center, my first visit to an evacuation center in Ishinomaki. And I, clearly I was shaken um, by what I saw in the people's eyes. And a 10 or 11 or 12 year old boy ran up to me and he put his arms around me and gave me a hug as if I was the one that needed to be comfort, comforted. And that image will stick with me for the rest of my life. Now, we've talked about different things of the challenges of communication and obviously there were challenges during that period of time uh, one of the biggest challenges is the U.S. ambassador and our team face uh, that's been touched upon was trying to get as much accurate information, communication to the Americans as the ambassador. There's, there's 150,000 Americans, 50,000 military and dependents there. And your number one responsibility is their health and safety. But at the same time, you have the responsibility to the relationship with Japan. 
and the humanitarian responsibility to reach out for a nation that was suffering. And so we were always balancing uh, getting accurate communication out there, not causing a panic, and letting people make their own decisions. And I would not be honest with you if I didn't say that the international media was one of the biggest challenges that we had during that period of time. It's hard to tell people that everything is going to be all right as a U.S. ambassador uh, when CNN headlines are countdown to meltdown and chaos and confusion in Japan. Uh, but we did our best, and Suzanne talked about the challenges of going back and forth uh, to Washington, D.C. for press releases and uh, approval of different communications. And fortunately, coming from Silicon Valley, uh, I realized, as my team did, that one of the best forms of communication was new media. So we utilized Twitter and YouTube, which the bureaucracy here in Washington, D.C. had not yet caught up with, so we didn't need approval <laughs> with regard to those communications. And I will tell you, the first time or I went on YouTube and delivered a message uh, that went viral, um, my wife, who, who was by my side on every, everything, every decision, that we did um, throughout that entire time. But uh, she saw me on YouTube. I came back, I said, as I always do, how'd I do? And she said, you look like crap. <laughs> and she took over um, the backdrop, the makeup, and uh, hopefully I projected a uh, better image to the American people and the Japanese people at that point in time. I don't want to spend too much time on the challenges that we face between our governments and getting information because I, I agree with Bert, with General Field, um, that no government could have been fully prepared, uh, even now, for the disaster that took place there. And um, it took time. It took time of us working together and different means of communication uh, for us to get a rhythm going. And um, Hosono san, who uh, is probably the most famous person in this room because of the process that was named after him, uh, was very instrumental. But the important point there was as time went on, communication got better and better and better. And I think uh, together, um, we, from the US perspective, helped, hopefully helped in a small way, uh, make some of the important decisions that the Jap Japanese government was making during that time or contribute to them. I do want to say something about um, one other memory, um, and that is the enormity and the implications of the decision of whether or not to evacuate. Um, the pressure, you know, was enormous. You have a responsibility to the health and safety of thousands of people. You have the responsibility of uh, maintaining and strengthening the bilateral relationship. And as I said, you have the responsibility of um, doing what's right, no matter what the facts. The pressure during that time was building, um, as was noted, a few of the European um, uh, countries had decided, and I, again, I don't cast aspersion on anyone, but it made the difficult decision to evacuate. Um, the media was putting incredible pressure uh, on in that regard. Uh, embassy families and Americans um, were concerned about their health and safety. And it really came down to uh, a group of us in Tokyo, as well as uh, many, many experts uh, in, here in the United States trying to truly understand what was going to happen with the nuclear situation. And I will tell you this, every day we had uh, in the embassy morning meetings with nuclear experts from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, 
the Department of Energy, uh, Navy nuclear reactor guys, the, the uh, president's scientific advisor would chime in from Washington uh, with his thoughts. And in the end, um, I am so glad that we all stayed um, to be there by our Japanese friends. And Troy Mueller, who was with the Navy nuclear reactor uh, team, uh, said to me, you know, wrote me a note subsequently. Um, that meant a lot to me because he was pushing my button many times during that crisis. And he said, thanks for listening. And I think probably uh, the most important thing besides compassion, humanity, and all the things that we've talked about, to me one of the most important things uh, of leadership in a crisis is knowing what you don't know, listening to the experts, sifting through the information, and ultimately hoping you make the right decisions and a little luck uh, as well. One other thought that uh, before I wrap up, was that's a memory that continues to this day is the genesis of the Tomodachi Initiative and uh, the words of Mayor Toba, Arika and Takata. Um, we were, after the crisis had subsided, looking for ways to continue to help, to find ways to help, and our team uh, met with the mayor of Rikas and Takata that you've heard uh, from Amia, what was going on there, the, the level of destruction and the loss of life. And the mayor who had lost his own wife, when I asked the question is, what could the United States continue to do to help? He said, you know, Mr. Ambassador, the Japanese government is responsible for rebuilding the bricks and mortars, for rebuilding our houses, for rebuilding our schools, our hospitals, our infrastructure. What the people of the United States can do is provide hope to our younger generation. And those words were the genesis. My team went back to the embassy, we brainstormed, and that led to the Tomodachi Initiative, which um, I'm so proud that to this day continues to provide hope to the young people of Japan. So let me just conclude by saying thank you to, to all of you people um, who are here today, that you know, we all shared the crisis together, as was pointed out by many. Uh, it created a bonding experience between us. For those of us who uh, are American, I know I speak for all the Americans to say how inspired we were by the Japanese people, the Japanese military, in particular the people of Tohoku. But also I just want to say to all of you how inspired I was by each of you, the professionals in this room, the people in the private sector, the NGOs, those who are still in Rikas and Takata uh, living on a day-to-day -day basis, the crisis that exists uh, to this very day, that to me, it was the honor of a lifetime to be part of what all of you did. People say to me, you know, um, what was it like? You know, was it horrible? Um, or do you wish you wouldn't have been there uh, during that period of time? And it's, it's a weird answer to say, yes, it was horrible in so many respects. Yes, it was stressful. Um, 20,000 people uh, lost their lives or are missing, the families that have been affected. But I will also tell you, um, because of all of you and many more who aren't in the room today, um, there's no other place I would have rather been during that period of time. Thank you very much. My name is Peter Beck. I'm with American University. And Mr. Ambassador, I just wanted to thank you uh, as an American who was in Japan 
Uh, thank you for the leadership that you showed in, in those ensuing days, uh, and particularly your decision not to leave Tokyo. I too did not become a fly gene, and I was particularly amused by a certain European government that said it sent its ambassador in DCM to Fukuoka and kept the embassy staff in Tokyo. That must have been great for morale for that, for that embassy. But I just wanted to thank you for the leadership that you showed, and uh, my most cherished object that I have from my time in Japan is a coin that you gave me, the ambassador's coin, and it just reminds me of, of what a great job you did. Thank you. Do you have any other uh, any questions from the audience? That's Richard. Hi, uh, my name is Richard Mann with the State Department Foreign Service Officer, and I just want to say uh, what an honor it was to work on the U Ambassador Roost for two years in Tokyo. And something that's not widely known outside of the State Department is that uh, the year after uh, everything that uh, Ambassador Roost told you about, uh, he was recognized um, by his peers uh, in the State Department with the Susan Cobb Award, which is annually given to the uh, ambassador, non-career ambassador for uh, extraordinary performance. And so I just want that to be more widely known that, he, uh, that his work, the extraordinary work he did in Japan during the time of the crisis was recognized throughout the State Department. And I also just want to mention that uh, there was a worldwide cable that went out at the t right immediately after the earthquake asking for volunteers to come to Tokyo uh, who had Japanese language ability. And of the uh, many, many volunteers who came from all over the world to help with the 24-hour operations, especially for American citizen services um, in Tokyo, uh, a large number of them were JET alumni. Mm -hmm. And this goes back to show that um, that initial experience that many of us had in Japan uh, early in our careers before we joined the Foreign Service, what it meant to us that um, despite the difficult situation in Japan at the time, uh, they felt compelled to go back. Uh, so I just wanted to mention those things, uh, those two things, and especially uh, my gratefulness to Ambassador Roos for, again, your leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Just for the record, I did not plant these people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Blair. Yep. Mr. Ambassador, on this question of Evacuation, it's not clear to me uh, how much um, evacuation took place in Japan that was not flying on an airplane to another place, but was simply moving further south in Japan. And if this uh, idea of, of moving a few hundred kilometers away as an alternative to get on an airplane and flying to another country was a, was a factor in, and how that all played out. Well. The answer to your question, Admiral, is um, it was a factor. Uh, during that period of time, we were analyzing, along with the military, uh, all different types of contingencies and responses to those con contingencies. And people uh, on their own relocated, uh, both out of the country and uh, down south. Um, you know, to be further away from the Fukushima site. Um, so all those were part of the uh, contingencies that, uh, that we were thinking about and planning for. Yes. Oh, Steve Winters, uh, independent consultant. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Uh, I think uh, former Prime Minister uh, Khan has said again, even recently, uh, how uh, confusing the situation was and his fear that he might have to evacuate even, uh, what is it, 50 million people or something. And, and of course, th this has been known for a long time. Uh, could you share any uh, um, insights that you had in dealing in a situation where, where the top level of the Japanese government itself uh, really was in the dark? Uh, and, for whatever uh, causes, uh, wasn't that sort of an extraordinary situation? Well, it, it was extraordinary. Obviously, yes, it was an extraordinary situation. <laughs> I think that uh, I, I'm not sure it's fair to say that that the Japanese government was in the dark. I think that the information flow uh, was changing constantly. Was uh, sometimes confusing, and experts 
disagreed on what that information meant. I know personally speaking, you know, I made a reference to sitting once a day in our office with our set of nuclear experts from the different departments of government and from the military. And I will tell you, uh, one of my challenges was sifting through that and finding where they agreed and where they disagreed. And when they disagreed, what was accurate and what was not accurate. And in addition, uh, information that we were getting from the Japanese government, which contained some subjective analysis by uh, senior officials within the government about what could happen, uh, contributed to uh, the information flow and some of the confusion, if that's the right word, that, that, that people reference now. I think it's, it's the fundamentally, there was a lack of, of information, there was massive information, there was different views upon what that information meant. And on the Jap in the Japanese government, they were trying to get their arms around it. In the US government, um, we had the additional challenge of not only trying to get around the information uh, that, that we had, but trying to get as much information uh, as we could from, from, uh, from the Japanese. Do we have time for one more question, James? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's time. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, this is not a question, just uh, introduced to audience. Uh, Ambassador mentioned about YouTube video, but uh, there is also good YouTube video. If you go YouTube, and uh, a Tomodachi Ogawa Ayaka. You know, there is really, a, if you haven't watched it, it's very inspiring, you know, footage, you know, on web. Ayaka lost parents, grandparents, and sisters. She was really alone, but uh, uh, Ambassador Ruth continuously care about Ayaka, you know, all the time, and that changed her life. And thanks to Ambassador, she got a scholarship and came to the States and study. And uh, she now lives in Kamaishi alone, but she's still really, you know, in high spirit. So really, you know, I, I, I was just observing one individual can change the course of, you know, those youth. And also this initiative was turned into this tomodachi. And uh, really, I really would like to thank you know, Ambassador for all those caring to those youth, you know, Japanese youth. Thanks a lot. Well, that's very nice, Matsunaga-san. I, I should say this. Um, I learned many different things today. Uh, but one of the most important things I learned was that I apparently saved your job. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what kind of reviews you were getting prior to my conversation. <laughs> but I do want to say this. Um, you know, again, I think all of us contributed in small ways um, to, to the effort. But the people I really admire are these people, Amya, Matsunaga-san, um, you know, spent a year, <laughs> we spent five years, and there's so much more that needs to be done. And those are um, the true heroes of, uh, of the martial arts crisis. So thank you. I think, I think we're out of time, and that's a great note to end on. So thank you very much, Ambassador Reese, for- Thanks.